Happy Sabbath, everybody. Paging Larry, Larry Rogan. Ah. Happy Sabbath, Feliz right. Sabado. Thank you. Feliz Sabado. Feliz Sabado. We've got the original men's quartet. That's actually, <laughs> hallelujah. It's actually the name of the group. We're not a quartet, we're a cinquet or what, quintet? Quintet. Anyways, Quintet, that's the name Quintet. of the group is Quartet. We got five guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's sing a song this morning. You want to stand with us? <laughs> Hamburger plates, five guys. Hamburgers. I have a song that Jesus gave me. He was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Is a melody. who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. Am I on now? No? Yes? I hear it. Okay. I'm so glad, dear God, that we can praise you and, and thank you for giving us hearts that have melodies. And I pray that we will be people who celebrate you in whatever way all day long, all week long, all our lives long, really, dear God. Please bless this service. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have some announcements. The Mid Meridian Church is hosting something this afternoon. There's an insert in your bulletin to tell you about it. So if you want to do it, read it and figure out what it is, okay? And a special thanks to everybody who helped clean up last Sunday, particularly Ben, who went around putting batteries in all the clocks. And that was a good thing because the one in our Sabbath school hasn't been running for a while. Okay, thank you. Um, prayer meeting is going to resume this Wednesday, um, and that's always good. The CUNA Chris O. This is our church's Christmas program, and that's going to be on. Jim, do you want to come up here? He's got stuff to share anyway, so I might as well get him up here. Tell him what you need. All right. You want it on your calendars for December 16. That's when we'll have our Christmas program. Our worship service will be a Christmas worship service that Sabbath morning, December 16. And if you would like to be a part of that, I need um, to see you. Come see me. I, I, we're going to do it. It's not going to be a dramatization. I think part of it, we just have, we have a shortness of time this year. 
but we're going to do some reading. So I need some good readers, people that want to read portions that will help draw our minds into what this birth of Christ has meant for mankind, what it means for us, okay? So if you want to do that, kids, parents of kids, if your kids want to dress up, if they, sometimes parents say, I've got a lamb costume for my kid, I've got a cow costume for my kid, if they want to dress up that morning or just have, you know, we want them to be a part of it. If the Sabbath schools, you have a song that you would like to sing or others here want to sing a song that day, similar to like we did at the Easter time last year, if you have a particular special music that you would like to share that's going to bring our hearts closer to our Lord and Savior through worship, that's what we want to get scheduled in, okay? It's going to be informal, but it's going to be wonderful. Come see me after church. Oh, oh, CUNA, Come Together CUNA Choir is December, let's see, that's December 3rd. That's going to be at the CUNA High School. However, you'll see it in the bulletin next Saturday night, 6 to 8 o'clock. I need some cookie makers right here in the church. We're going to put together some cookies. Churches and others put together cookies that give out to the guests that come, and we're going to make about 20 dozen cookies. All right? We can do that. And you might have some fun frosting them. And I think it's a fitting thing that if we do that, then we could enjoy the gymnasium as well. So if you want to come out just for a fun Saturday evening next Saturday night, the 25th, Let's put some cookies together and have some fun doing it. Okay. And the next day, they get to go to the ABC Open House and then come here and help decorate the church for Christmas and then go to the concert. That'll... Oh, yeah, okay, I'm confused. We have two weeks. Okay, well... Anyway, please put on your calendars December 3, because that's the day when everything is happening, yeah. evidently. All right, it's time for our praises. Sorry. CUNA Come Together would love to have you come, and come to the concert. Um, you can go to the Facebook page, Come Together CUNA. And the reason I'm saying this, the tickets are free, but they sell out every year. And they are going very quick, and I think they had less than 10% left. So go to your Facebook, Come Together CUNA, and there's a place there. But the tickets are free, so, so join us. It's a really wonderful, wonderful CUNA event and an opportunity to get to know our neighbors. Thank you, Molly. Um, we're going to have praises and prayer requests now. Obviously, um, well, some of you know that Hill had his hip replacement surgery yesterday. I'm happy to report to you it went so well that they had him up walking. Of course, they would do that anyway. But besides that, he was already texting people to tell them us he was okay. And he was answering things on Facebook, wasn't he, Liz? Yes. So um, obviously, he's doing well. And he will be going home today. And uh, they just ask if you feel like you need to visit him that you call first. Okay? Call, call, yeah, call Patty. And I will tell you that her phone number is incorrect in the directory, but in the, in the bulletin, it's correct. So if you pay attention to the bulletin and correct it in the directory, you'll be in good shape. All right? Typos happen. As my old boss, editor boss, used to say, doctors get to bury their mistakes. Editors have to print theirs. <laughs> So, there we go. All righty, are there any praises this morning? Nobody has anything to celebrate? Oh, Pastor Jim does. Justin, can you get that to him? Oh, it's this Justin walking around with the mic. Hey, I, I'm glad Justin is here today. Yeah. Oh, I just we do appreciate have the him. other Justin. But okay. I... I I want to just say, you know, every one of us, well, it, for many people, they get, like, school is out for the next week and at the Thanksgiving break, but it's not just a time to enjoy the good food that comes our way, although we always can enjoy that. It should be, and it is a time to really reflect, God is good all the time, right? Um, 
through our hardships, through our trials, he's good all the time. Yeah. I want to praise you. I know that Bob and Paula left today. Bob is not feeling well today, but he was in the hospital yesterday, and he got to go home. And I praise God that it wasn't worse than it could have been. Yes, right? exactly. So there's many things that we can praise God about. I want to share one thing about Hill. You can tease him when you get back. I, I told him I, I was going to take notes of the things he was saying under medication and include it in a sermon sometime. But, <laughs> but, but really, he didn't say anything bad, but you could, you could make him wonder when he comes back. Why okay. not? He would make us wonder. Um, and let me just say how wonderful it was um, to have so many CUNA people involved with the Christmas concert at the Idaho Center on Wednesday, the uh, Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant concert. I was so proud of our church and, and the people who were leading out from our church. And I want you to know that that Brenda Woodson could organize just about anything, including a Pathfinder Camporee. I was pretty impressed. All right. Yes, Grace. I have a couple of praises. Um, the first is that Josh, our grandson, is going to be home for Thanksgiving. Amen. And we haven't seen him since the end of August, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. Uh, ben will be alone uh, in the Air Force down at Holloman, so keep him in prayers. But, you know, I've, I'm greeting this morning, and I've got to tell you what a joy that is. People come in, and people are happy here. People are glad to see each other. And I'm thankful for that atmosphere. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Justin, can you give that to Don? Thank you. And I just want to praise the Lord for how he's working in my life and how he continues to work even through trials and everything to draw, draw me closer. Yes. Amen. And Desiree, just, let's see. Justin, there's somebody back there too. Rick, he... Uh, get, well, never mind. Get Desiree. It's fine. Okay, this is Justin. Thank you. Okay. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I have, I just praise the Lord for the doctors that he has put in my life because um, I go to a pain clinic. I've been there two years with my um, doctor there, and she's just amazing. And I just take her for granted sometimes, you know. They're there. Um, but I just want to praise God today that, that I do have those people in my yes. life for, yes. to take care of me. And this guy, Amen. too. Amen. And then, Molly, and then we'll get back to Maria. Rick, behind, behind you, too. And I'll get Daphne, too. Okay, Molly. So Michael Cedillo online is saying that he is thankful for his wonderful wife, Maria, for putting up with him and thanking the Lord for her. So thank you, Jesus, for Miss Maria. Yes, and I'm happy for Maria, too, because this place is clean because of her. Thank you, nice lady. Okay, Maria, go ahead. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I want to have, have a praise for um, just how God's working in my life, um, just the people he puts in my path and just events and stuff, I know that, you know, I've had a hard year, but uh, I, I'm seeing growth in it now, and I'm thankful for that, and uh, I took Michael to our version of the concert, we went to Winter Jam on Thursday, yeah. and um, little Michael was just singing away and singing songs, and he said there was a song they sang that they sing up at camp, and he was so proud to just sing it and just I'm glad that there's different uh, ways that God speaks to us through music, through people, and I'm just thankful for that. And um, I want to pray or request, uh, uh, um, these are tears of joy. <laughs> my brother and my mom are going to come up here tomorrow, and okay. they're going to spend the week up here. Good. And... Um, it's just, that's an answer to prayer, you know. Yeah, I just, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, yay. Thank you so much. Mo uh, Molly, did, were you? No, we already did you. Go ahead, Leanne. Sorry, <laughs> I'm confused now. I just love having all of Justin's family here today. That's a real blessing for us. We're yeah, glad no you're kidding. all here. And yeah. it was fun to see Dottie come in with Joel and Tanya. And I want to remember their 
uh, Dottie's daughter Sherry, who is dealing with yes. cancer and yes. and ongoing for the family yes. as well as Sherry finished her last chemo, I think Monday or Tuesday, um, for <laughs> this round. And so just yeah. prayers yeah. for Sherry She's and Daryl. She's a sweetheart. Yeah, and uh, last night um, several of us got together for a. A new praise team we're kind of working with, and we had an absolute ball singing together with Good. the guitars. Good. So, to come guitar praise singing group eventually, mm. um, it's just going to be fun. So I'm <laughs> thankful. I don't think Gary's going to sing without Leanne for the first two months, but of January or of the next year. But it'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, yes, D uh, Daphne, you had something you wanted to share? Yes, um, that my mom can feel better because she's in a lot of pain right now because she's just had her surgery. Yeah. And yeah. it's hard to see her do that. Yes, it is hard to see mom sick, isn't it, sweetie? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, we'll be happy to pray for her. Thank you. All right. And one of the caregivers at my mom's assisted living told me um, last night she's going to Sun Valley today because a niece of hers, a four-year-old, is in the hospital. She has diabetes and she had to have a foot am amputated because the sore wouldn't heal. And so I don't know her name or any of the, anything else, but that's a really hard thing. Uh, Vivian, go ahead. Well, um, you can see we're full back here with people, so thankful of new people learning the sound system and taking on responsibilities. My brother-in-law, Sean, is helping, and um, praise for uh, this coming Thanksgiving. We're having quite a bit of our family coming in from different places. My uh, parents are coming, in-law are coming from Colorado, um, and aunt-in-law is coming from Seattle, so we're going to have a big... Uh, family gathering this Thanksgiving. That little house of yours is going to be no, full. No, not us. Uh, uh, <laughs> Our house can do it. Even better. <laughs> Sean's, Sean's house is doing it. All right. <laughs> but it's awesome that we're going to have that, yeah. that many people. It's really fun to have Continued family. prayer for me at work. Yeah. Ongoing. Um, and, of course, prayer for Dan and the guys out at the prison. Yes. Amen. Uh, I, yes. <clears throat> oh, oh, go ahead, Kitty. <laughs> I thank the Lord for such a beautiful day today. Mm. Don't you agree? Amen. It's just it, it, in one of those things that uh, it, have, it, it could have snowed over and, and whatnot, but he has given us a beautiful Sabbath day to enjoy. Yeah. And I love the snow on the mountains. It's just when it wanders down here, I'm not so sure. Go ahead, Don. You have something else? Yes, um, I wanted to pray for a friend of mine, Dave Latta. His aunt Chloe is on hospice, and they don't give her much time to live. And then one of our coworkers, his sister, who has diabetes really bad, she's on hospice too. Yeah, it's, it's tough, isn't it? Really tough. Okay, I think that's everything. Let, those of you who, who can kneel, and I'm not one of them, um, please do, and we'll um, have prayer. Dear God, what a privilege it is for us to come together to worship you, to tell you and each other all the things that we're so grateful for. And especially this time of year, we need to be thinking more about what we appreciate. And I pray that we will always be people who look for ways to praise you even in the middle of stuff that's pretty hard. I thank you that you're a God who just loves to give good gifts to his children. And that not only do you want to give us good gifts, but you, want, but you stick by us when stuff is really hard. And there are a lot of things that are tough. Um, aches and pains and worse. Um, unrest, upset in families. Um, 
all these things, job challenges, people in prison, so many things that are so tough. And yet, if we can see it, and if we remember, and if we study the promises that you have given us, we will know with absolute surety that you are there, sharing it with us, lifting more than um, lifting the burdens, and making it possible for us to live in this world of sin and still be tasting heaven. So I do pray, dear God, that you would be with all these requests, all these concerns, the ones we haven't even talked about. Please answer in the way you know best and in your good time. And I pray that everything that happens this morning um, and on into the afternoon in this service will be something that will bring a smile to your lips and joy to your heart as well as to ours. Please especially be with Pastor Jim as he shares some insights with us about happiness. And be with us with that good food that's waiting for us out in the, the gym after the service. Thank you for good cooks. We love you so much, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. JT, come on down. Kids, go to the back, get your baskets, run around and see if people have money for you, and then come up here and JT has a story. Oh, and he's gonna have to get the baskets because Irwin isn't here. <laughs> All right, kids, there are the baskets. Okay, happy Sabbath. Okay, so next, oh, we got a few, got a few stragglers. Come on on, come on down. So next week, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. And when you think of Thanksgiving, I'm going to ask you, ask all of you, and I'm going to ask the parents too, when you think of Thanksgiving, what do you think? What do you think of? And, uh, and while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you what Thanksgiving, when I think of it, what I think about. 
I think about my mom because the year, you know, Thanksgiving is on the, the fourth Thursday of November and it rotates. The year my mom was born, she was born on Thanksgiving. So I always think of her. And then um, I think about what I'm thankful for too, that, you know, at the stage that my, uh, my mom is in now of life, she doesn't know who I am and can't take care of herself. But I'm thankful that the Lord has given me the strength to be able to take care of her and do the things that I need to do. So when we think about Thanksgiving, what do we think about? Spending time with family. Okay. What do you think about? And what are you thankful for? So if you're thinking about Thanksgiving, what are you thankful for? Hanging out with family. Hanging out with family. That's a big... Hanging out for my family. Okay, family again. Okay. Well, I want to tell. You don't want to say? Oh, okay. <laughs> You're being shy? Okay. Well, you know, there's lots of things for us to be thankful, especially in our country, right? You know, thankful that not only that we have enough food to eat, but also that God allowed us to wake up this morning, right? You know? And that uh, lots of things for us to be thankful for. And it's more than just food and as... And it's encouraging to see that just all the kids are actually saying family, right? You know, it's about spending time with family. But one of the, th one of the things to, be, to really think about in being thankful is when you're thankful, it brings joy to your heart and it gives you that peace that God is in control, right? So think about that when, as we're celebrating Thanksgiving and it's, it's, we're doing lots of different things with our family. But remember, there's lots of things to be thankful for. Okay? Happy Sabbath. Okay, you can go back to your seat. Our offering today is for the church budget. And I am incredibly grateful for this church. The, the building is gorgeous, and, um, and what a blessing it has been to all of us. But, and the congregation is even gorgeouser, if that's a way to put it. Um, each one of you are so special to me, and I thank you each one for being in my life. And we just all need to work together to make our payments for everything. And I know you know that, but just don't forget the end of the year is a time when um, we're figuring out everything for Uncle Sam. So remember to keep the church in mind when you have to think about Uncle Sam too, okay? <laughs> all right. Well, the deacons, please come forward. By the way, I don't think I mentioned, but today is our Thanksgiving potluck, and I happen to know that there is an overabundance of food, so even if you didn't bring any, please come, all right? Cuna cooks are great, I tell you. All right, let's pray. Thank you, dear God, for allowing us to participate with you in service and in giving back to help sustain your work in this world. Please multiply our gifts and use them in the place where they are needed. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Beautiful. You know, I have a little secret. Do you guys want to hear a secret? Um, no, I don't. You don't? Okay. I'm going to tell you anyways. <laughs> when Tristy first came up and she was handing off ministries to, to, become, uh, to form new leadership group, I think she pulled you and me aside and she said, we're thinking about forming new, uh, new groups when Candy and her were stepping down a little bit. And she said, well, do you guys feel comfortable um, maybe leading a group or stepping up front? And I remember saying, I will, but I doubt if I'm going to say very much when I'm up <laughs> I just thought I'd share that with you because it's I when I said it I kind of felt maybe I'm lying. <laughs> Anyways, that's just a little secret. Anyways, while I picked the, we picked these three songs today, we're in oh, the before you start, Tracy. Please, in case you haven't recognized this, yes, that last song that we had was a minute of meditation. Uh huh. We need to acknowledge that. You need to get to know that piano oh, player. My She's goodness. phenomenal. Really, is she? I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, Amen. Every day <laughs> <in here>. Amen. <laughs> it's a moment of ministry. Amen. I agree. You're I, biased. I have a crush on her, but I don't. Anyways, that's my bride to be. Anyways, I, I yeah, I you stumped me on that one. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning it. What we're here for is to praise God, and I we picked three songs with the attitude of thankfulness. And what came to my mind is how great God is, and it just makes me thankful with the love that He's given us. And we got three really good songs. If you'd like to stand and sing with us, let's do just that. Oh, my. 
to have a seat for this last song, you're welcome to. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond and 
strong, it shall forevermore endure, the saints and Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. There we go. All right. You know, there's one thing I know for sure. The early preachers of the gospel didn't have this issue. <laughs> right? They had others. It's fun when you learn about some of the early preachers and you learn some of the things they did. Remember, which preacher was it? Was it Wesley that would write his sermons on the back of the horse going backwards, like he would, he would sit backwards on his horse. I think, I have to look that one up. I can't remember who that one was. As he traveled across the country preaching. So he had other issues, right? Anyway, it's a good Sabbath. It's a good Sabbath. And Sam? When is the day you and family leave? So you're going to be here. Will you be here next Sabbath? All right, because I want to make sure. Sam, his family, his family, they get to go see family in Kenya. First time for your kids, is that right? So this is wonderful. We've got to keep them in prayer. That's a long travel, and that's got to be exciting for them and for grandparents and things. Um, there was once a man who... Woke up on Sabbath morning, and he said, Honey, I don't want to go to church today. The people there are hypocrites. Uh, they gossip, they complain, they're difficult to deal with. And besides, I just don't feel like going. I'd rather stay home. She said, Honey, that would be nice, but you can't do that. Why not? Because you're the pastor. <laughs> right? There are times that every one of us, including a pastor, your pastor, could have times where we say, I just don't feel too happy about Jesus this week, or I don't feel happy about me this week. There may be times, maybe, where you're feeling that same way, where you don't want to go to church because you feel like if I go, i got to put on a happy face, and I don't feel happy. I don't feel good today for whatever reason. Has anybody ever felt that? That's okay if you, you don't have to put up your hand. Some might say, well, in those cases, you fake it till you make it, right? Have you ever heard that? Now, sometimes that's, that's used in, in singing in choirs and things like that where they just say, if you don't know the words, just say watermelon. Did you ever hear that? <laughs> yeah. Fake it till you make it. I want to tell you, but that's not always easy, and that's certainly not always best. Would, what would it look like, and I want to tell you, CUNA is on the road in this area, going the right direction. 
What would it look like if God's people and God's houses of worship were places where people could come regardless of their happy face or no happy face and know that it was okay to be there? To where if they came in and they're having a lousy day, they don't have to tell you they're having a good day. You see, we're all broken. The reality of life is that we all will go through moments in our life where life is not going so well for us. There are times where we don't want to or can't put on a happy face. Could be something health-wise. Maybe you're diagnosed or someone in your family, a loved one, is diagnosed with a terrible disease and you're not really feeling very good right now. Maybe it's news of a lost job. I, I talked with my insurance agent yesterday, and this is a little bit of a side, but you know from my back injury, my medical health has been, has been covering it, and then now I got a, wonder, have you ever gotten a letter in the mail that's from a legal team? That's kind of scary, right? When you get this letter, it says such and such legal associates, open it up, and they basically, they want to charge the claim to my auto insurance since it was uh, an insured vehicle of ours that, that ran over me. <laughs> so, yeah. Nonetheless, you get through it, right? And talking to my insurance agent yesterday, I used to work for Farmers Insurance. Oops, I just said that over the air. Um, anyway, he was saying that yesterday a lot of people that he knew were going to be getting pink slips because they're downsizing or something. And there might be that news. Maybe you've just, your, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend has just broke up with you and you don't feel too good about it. I want to tell you that a church that could be vulnerable and open enough to receiving people that are not feeling good about life is a church that is following in the footsteps of Jesus. And today, I want to share with you the thoughts of what a church like that might look like and how we as followers of Jesus are to respond to people who come in and don't have a happy face. And also how if you're not having a happy face or you'd, you don't feel good about life, I want you to know that there is hope for you, that there's good news right around the corner. Jesus is in the business of changing our lives and taking what looks bad and making it into something good. We must ask a question. Can the church be a place where we can be ourselves, warts and all? I hope so. It needs to be. A place where we don't need to put on a happy face. A place where you're not okay, but that's okay because God loves you anyway. And what can the church do for those who don't feel so good? And finally, when we're down, is there any hope for change? These are the three questions I want us to look at today as we open up God's Word and see what He has to say about how we're to treat one another when people are struggling and how He brings us hope. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, every day we wake up with choices to make and sometimes choices are thrust upon us that make it hard for us to make a choice to put on a happy face because we don't see things the way that, that we want to. I'm so grateful that your son Jesus demonstrated that there's good news in him. That in Christ, while things don't have to always be well, we can find joy because he is our redeemer. Today we want to lift him up as we worship you together. As we open your word, give us insight, each one, not just a few, but each one of us that we might understand better how as your followers we can best reach people who are struggling. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So sometimes we might, you might get the feeling that if you come to Christ and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, that everything is going to be all right. Has anybody ever felt that way? It's supposed to. Or we come to church and we see, well, the pastor's smiling and Aunt Aline is smiling and Milford and Grace are smiling. Everybody's smiling but me. I must have something wrong. Has anybody ever felt like that? You don't have to put your hand up. There might be times that we might ask ourselves, is it wrong for me as a believer to ever have a bad day? I would tell you if you'd open up your Bibles, you're going to find that over and over characters in the Bible had bad days. And they talked about it. And they poured their hearts out to a God who they wondered at times, was he there? Was he listening? Could he do something about it? 
If you're wondering and you're not sure, I would encourage you that sometime this week, maybe even this, this day today, take some time to read about the likes of people like King David. Read about Job. Read about Moses or Jeremiah or Hannah or Ruth or Tamar or Naomi. All people in the Bible. And, and then look at the history of other people in history who had those bad days where it was not easy to be a happy-faced Christian. They still had their times of doubt, even though they were following the living God. They had their times of wondering what's going to happen next. They had their times where life was no, not so good. You look at the life of Jeremiah. Look at the book Lamentations. What a title. Hmm? He had his times where he was sad. For, so for just a couple examples of that, to see, is it ever wrong for someone who follows God to be unhappy or have a bad day. Take a look. Here's an example. Psalm chapter 6. And by the way, David had a number of them. You know, G David, we might say, well, he, he's a man after God's heart. He has everything going his way. Shouldn't he have been happy? King of Israel. And we find that David also had his times of agonizing. Some of the things he brought on himself some of the things were thrust upon him. Nonetheless, it affected him. So Psalm 6, verse 6 and 7. Here's David. He's speaking. I'm weary with groaning. Excuse me. I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. Hmm. Does anybody do that? All right. True confession time. Does anybody hear a cover kicker? Yeah, I have kids that have done that. How many remember those days when your kids are little and they're in bed with you and they always get in the middle and then it's like this all night. The covers are flailing because they're kicking the covers off because they're too hot. You ever have that? Our kids were that way. David says, all night I make my bed swim. We might say he's tossing and turning. He's having a fitless sleep. He can't rest. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My, eyes, my eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Is David describing someone who's saying, hey, wasn't it wonderful that we went through the green pastures today, skipping along and everything was well? No, David is saying, I'm not doing good, Lord. I've got enemies. I can't sleep. I'm crying till I can't cry anymore. I'm having a bad day. Next one is in Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1, the story of Hannah. And this is only part of her story, but it's a very good story. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'm just going to read through, we're just going to take a look at the first 15 verses because I think in context it, it ties the story together. So there's a man named Elkanah. Elkanah. There's some elk hunters in here. That's not elk as the same, but anyway, Elkanah. There was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeho Jer Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. That might have been his first problem. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And wherever, whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And said, it says, so it was year after year when she went up into the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? 
Now that's the part, just for guys here, we do not understand. We can't comprehend what that must feel like to a woman who wants to have kids but is unable. So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. And not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. And then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Does Hannah sound like she's happy? No. She wants to have kids. She can't have kids. She's got another lady in her husband's life who has kids and then rubs her face in it and says, I got kids and you don't. Ha ha. She's so distraught that Eli thinks she's drunk. A happy face was impossible for her. Not something that she could just do. She couldn't walk down to the church and say, today I feel good. Instead, we find in her life, she's pouring her heart out to a God who she knows can do something about it, but nothing's been done yet. You see, it's normal to be a believer in God and at times have times when we are sad. My advice for anyone that's going through difficulties is to keep coming to the church to worship your God because he loves you. To keep coming to fellowship with others who can lift you up and gain strength from God through, through others who care for you. I talked last Sabbath I was here about it's impossible, it's really difficult, I would say impossible to be a Lone Ranger Christian. That's why God has given us this place together to come together in fellowship and in worship. And I would say to you today, if you are struggling like King David, struggling like Hannah, struggling with whatever issues are going on in your life, the last thing you should do is become isolated. What you need to do is come and refresh your soul, pouring your heart out to the church and to the God who can do something about it. So having a bad day and not having a happy face is okay. But then, what about the church? What's our responsibility in it? Uh, Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Paul is getting ready to go into this section. It's a famous section verses 5 through 11 of Philippians 2, where he talks about having the mind of Christ. He prefaces it here in verse 3, basically saying, that mind of Christ should look like this, value others above yourselves. Not easy to do, but it's great advice from God through Paul. You see, when we learn to value others above ourselves, then we begin to understand and love them unconditionally as God loves us unconditionally and as we expect him to. As long as self is in the way, it becomes difficult to just see people as people and not put something upon them that we think they should do or could do or whatever to alleviate their suffering. Paul tells us, in humility, value others by, above yourselves. He understands it's not natural for us, but it is important that we do it. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. The acronym Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. Right? That's how I learned to remember it. I was having some popcorn last night. It wasn't just any popcorn. It was the popcorn where sherry melts down like the, uh, what is it, almond bark? No. Yeah. 
and drizzles that over it. Oh, my. Watch out. Yeah. My Bible says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, and bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What would that law of Christ be? We're not just talking Ten Commandment law. Remember what he said in John 13? That's right. Love one another. When you do, everybody's going to know you're my follower. Love one another. We read in Paul's writings that love covers a multitude of sins. There's no asking me, that's James. So Paul says, if a man is stuck in sin, you who are not need to restore that person in a spirit of gentleness and bear one another's burdens so and so fulfill the law of Christ. When someone is struggling with sin or otherwise, and by the way, I want to make this clear, someone not having a good day, not being a happy-faced Christian does not mean they're struggling with sin, okay? Is that, is that clear? But if they are struggling with sin, and I would tie in there, I would say that, that Paul would say, you know, when you see someone that is struggling, let's just say it that way, treat them gently. Treat them gently. I must confess that I haven't always done that, in particular with my kids, right? Toughen up. That's the wrong way to do it. Treat them gently. We all know the pain that guilt and sorrow causes. And we should be careful how we treat others, especially when they need us most. If we are harsh with those who are coming looking for gentleness, we're asking them to go a different direction. We're making it easy for them to have an excuse not to be here. Here, Paul says, we're to carry one another's burdens. Now, I don't believe that this means for the pastor or any one of us that we say, come to me, I'm going to solve your problems. If you've ever been in that situation, you'll find that it doesn't work because we are not here to fix others. But it does mean coming alongside people and walking with them through their trials with our prayers, with our presence, and with practical, tangible ways where maybe we can help. Right? If you come to me and you say, I'm, I'm struggling, Jason comes to me and says, Pastor, I've had a really bad day. The human nature side, at least on the man's brain, wants to fix it, right? I don't think that's what God says for us to do. But I can come alongside Jason and I can say, I'm sorry to hear about that. Can I pray with you? Let's say, heaven forbid, Jason found out he's got to go in for some surgery. Or he's got some trial he's going through. I can say to Jason, Jason... This is what I can tell you you can count on me doing. I'm not only going to be praying for you, but I'm really ready to walk with you every step while you're through going through this. And then the practical, tangible ways, he might say, you know, while that process is going on, I could really use some help cleaning my gutters. I could use some help with the things I won't be able to do. That's the practical side. Our job as the church individually and corporately, is not to fix others. I learned this the hard way. That's sometimes when people come to the pastor, and maybe they've come to you as well, Larry, any of us who have counseled Fran, and they say, I have this problem. And again, our brain kicks into gear, put on our Superman suit, let's fix it. I learned that what happens is sometimes when you do that, and most times when you do that, the individual then is saying, I can take all my problems to you, and then I don't have to deal with them. I learned from another pastor who said, Jim, that's the wrong way to go about it. What you do if you're counseling with someone, if they have a struggle, you help them to come up, them to come up with a solution. And then you give them the homework, and you say, go try this. And he said, I tell them, don't come and see me until you've tried it. Because otherwise, what happens is, it's here's my luggage, I'm going to give it to you. Here's my junk, and then you carry it around. 
But I can tell you, we can come alongside others as a loving friend, showing compassion, offering encouragement, and always, always, always pointing them to Jesus. Letting them know that I may not have the answers, but he does. I may not be able to tell you what's going to happen next, and you can trust that God is in charge. There's a Swedish proverb that says, shared joy is double joy, and shared sorrow is half sorrow. Isn't that true? When, when you have good news and you tell it to somebody else, you can't keep it to yourself, and you tell it to somebody else, it doubles it and it becomes more exciting. And when you have sorrows and you're having struggles, and they can be big and they can be small, but when you have someone coming alongside to help you, it somehow just changes everything and makes it small. Have you ever been working, men here, have you ever been working on your car or anything else at the house and you just can't get it because you don't have enough arms? You try that like you're changing out the serpentine belt and you can't pull that tensioner down with one arm and replace the belt with the other. And then, and then along comes somebody. Joel comes over and he says, hey, can I give you a hand with that? What happens? First of all, we can get it solved. It reduces the stress. But second of all, just having someone there changes how I feel about what I'm going through. You know what? Can you, can you relate to that? First Corinthians 12 tells us, guess what? We're all part of one body. And if, if our body, if any part of our body, if we have a cold, if we have a broken bone, something, we want to take care of that. And 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that just the same way, we're part of one body, we need each other. And as such, those who are well need to come alongside those who are not and reassure them that you're there, but more important, that Jesus is there and he loves them. Proverbs 17, 22 tells us that a cheerful heart is good medicine. But we know what a crushed spirit does, right? It says it dries up the bones. The church can and should be the place where the good medicine is dispensed to those who need it. Now, sometimes we might think that medicine didn't do any good. But I want to tell you the medicine that God dispenses and offers up is a medicine that the world doesn't understand. And we're not talking about just physical, solving physical ailments. I'm talking about spiritual mal maladies where people are struggling spiritually when they can come to the realization and have this comfort and peace that passes understanding because they are trusting Jesus. That's good medicine. There's a friend of mine, Steve. I met him. I met him through a church member who had been doing some volunteer work. This fellow had had back surgery. Not a believer, and in fact, very angry with the world. And this fellow from church had been visiting him, and he had that gentle spirit, and he began to soften Steve. And then Steve said, I'd like to see your pastor. So I went and began to visit with Steve, and, and he had had this back surgery, and he, because he was in such pain, he had pain medicine, which would make him sleepy. He had Bible questions, and I would begin to answer those Bible questions, and he would fall asleep in the middle of the question. There were times when I would go over to visit Steve, and, and it didn't seem like anything I tried could change his outlook. And I thought, he needs a cheerful heart. Have you ever read Patrick McManus' books? Anybody? Fun stories. And I took a Patrick McManus book over. And by the way, those are not biblical, just so you know. And I began to read stories to Steve. And his countenance changed. And he started to laugh. And he started to look up. And he started to stay awake longer. He started to change. And I realized what was lacking in his life was socialization. He was housebound. He had no one. Long story short, God is so good. I visited with Steve and worked with Steve and studied with Steve, and he gave his heart to the Lord and was baptized. 
I've never said that maybe Patrick McManus books are a great Bible study to have, but they certainly seem to open up the door in this case. We, as members of God's family, are to look after one another. Spiritually, we can do something by our presence, by our prayers, and by our practical ways to help other people to keep their eyes on Jesus so that he can change their heart and help them to get through whatever it is they're going through. I have two passages I want to uh, turn to really quick, and those are Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. We read that already uh, with Michael. Thank you, Michael, for reading that. Where's he at? Did he step out? Oh, he might be back in the kitchen. All right. But go to Matthew 11. I want to take a look at this again. Jesus offers something for everyone here and everyone that we know. The answer to all the craziness in this world is men and women coming to Jesus. And he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He doesn't invite us to do more things. He just says, Come to me. He doesn't say, try and fix it yourself. Tell me about your problems and fix it yourself. Jesus says, come to me. You're burdened? You're worn out? You're downtrodden? Are you sorrowful? Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Another passage, go back to Old Testament really quickly, Psalm 34 and verse 17 and 18. Psalm 34, 17 and 18. The psalmist understood this as well. My Bible says the righteous cries out, cry, the, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Who is the one who delivers us? God. That's right. I can't fix your problems, you can't fix mine, but we can point people to the one who can. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and he saves such as have a contrite spirit. That's good news. The Lord is near. Is your heart hurting today? God is near. You come to him and you pour out your heart to him and he doesn't close his ears and say, I can't hear that. Instead, he opens up his heart and he opens up his ears and he opens up his arms and he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'm here to provide for you what you can't get anywhere else. I understand what you're going through. Like that great parent, how many of you ever, and I tell you, moms are fantastic at this, your mom, do you remember those times, those wonderful times when you're a child and your mother helped you get through, console you through something that you thought was never going to get fixed. And your mom comes alongside, and gently she gives you a hug, and she holds you, and she says, I love you. Do you know that's what Jesus wants to do for every one of us? If you're downtrodden today, I have good news. God is close. He comes close to those who are hurting. He loves it when we call upon him, and he says, I will save you. Now, sometimes we interpret that to mean everything's going to be rosy from here on out, and I want to tell you, the Christian life is oftentimes a lot of suffering and a lot of sorrow and a lot of things that don't go well, but our God is amazing, and he's going to deliver. I want you to know that the final part of this that's so good is that what helps us if we're not having a good day, we can't put on the happy face, is that Jesus is the one who replaces what is broken. He mends what is broken. He takes away the hurt, and he says, I will bring you true happiness. I want to share a story. This is a book. I think I told you about this book before, Aline. James Tucker, James and Priscilla Tucker, a book called In His Hands. Maybe I shared it here at church one time, but this is a story about a rodent. This rodent, listen up, so let's see who's going to have some good ears here to guess this. this. This rodent weighs more than 100 pounds, maybe more than 4 feet long, and stands about 21 inches high. Does anybody know what kind of a rodent it is? That's exactly right. Do you have one of those, Nancy? Good. <laughs> capybara. And the capybara, I think they're a South American animal. Um, they live solely on vegetation. In order to eat, the capybara stands belly deep in water and munches on aquatic plants. 
On land, it nibbles grasses and fruits, and sometimes it wanders onto farmlands where it can become a pest. I can imagine. A, what kind of a cage do you need for that? Wow. The capybara usually feeds at dawn or dusk unless it senses danger. Then it changes its habits and waits until dark because the capybara is a favorite food of jaguars. But if it manages to avoid being killed by a hungry cat or an angry farmer, it can live to be up to 12 years old. There's a remarkable characteristic of the capybara, is, and that's its grace and buoyancy in water. Its body's not streamlined, streamlined like the otter's. Instead, its body fat balances the weight of its bones. It's as though the capybara has a built-in life jacket to keep it floating high in the water. In addition, with its webbed toes, the capybara is an excellent swimmer. Is it any wonder that the two most common names for the animal are the water pig and the water hog? There's a spiritual buoyancy lesson here as well for us. And that is, is if we have Jesus in our lives, he says, we can float. When we're discouraged, when we're disappointed, we can look to the Savior to find strength. We can find courage. And we can find hope. We can join the psalmist in saying, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now, I'm not saying anyone here is a capybara. But there's a good lesson there. If we have Jesus, we're going to be all right. It may not be today, and it may not be tomorrow, and it may be today, and then tomorrow we may not feel like it. But the point is, is that God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The good news from Psalm 42.5 is that you don't have to remain unhappy. Think about it. If every time we come to church, now we bear with you gently, but if every time you come to church you're bearing your sor sorrow, we bear with you gently, but Jesus is going to take that away. Let him. Let him heal your hurt. Let him heal your pain. Sometimes it's not always easy to see your lemons every day, right? If every time I saw my wife, I came home and she said, how was your day? And I just threw the lemons out at her and said, here's my lemons. She might say, you got anything else? Can we have anything else? I want to tell you that Jesus may not change your situation, but he will change your heart, and he will give you a reason for joy that is not explainable by the world's standards. And I want to appeal to you, church, to be and remain a place that is a hospital, as you've heard this term, a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. A hospital for sinners, for the broken, for the hurting, so that they can get well, because the wellness comes from Jesus. A place where it's okay if you aren't okay, because you know, and we know, and we show that God loves you anyway. If we are that kind of a church, even when a happy face isn't easy, I want to tell you that others will know that joy in Jesus is on the way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, every one of us in this room has times or has had times in the past or we will have times in the future where it is difficult to feel good about our walk with you or just our life in general. Please help us as your followers, as your family, to love on people that are hurting so that they can know that it's okay if they're not happy because we know the end result is joy when they come to know you. Help us to encourage and lift up and come alongside those who are hurting, remembering, Lord, that you come alongside us. Father, we want to be that kind of a church family where even if things aren't okay, we know you love us anyway. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You know, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes as I'm going through scriptures, I will come upon a passage that I've never thought about before or read in the right way before, or maybe with a different set of eyes, I read it, and I found this one, Jeremiah 31, 10 through 14, and I want to leave you with this today. No matter what you're going through, your God is going to win, and that's what we have to know. The times we live in are very exciting, and I believe Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when that is. But I'm counting on it, trusting in him until that day. And here's what it says. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. That's you. That's me. And declare it in the aisles afar off and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one who's stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming, streaming to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be like a well-watered garden and they shall sorrow no more at all. 
Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young man and the old together, for I will turn their mourning to joy, will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Amen. Your God is on the way. Amen. No matter what you're going through, he will take you through it. And I just pray you hang on and keep trusting him, for he loves you. We love you. Have a blessed Sabbath. We'll hope to see all of you, as many as possible, join us for a meal this afternoon.